You may know this. O. Henry's Gift of the Magi, directed by John McTiernan. <laughs> 640 million red hats. That was all, and most of it was in the vault at Nakatomi Plaza. <laughs> hats saved one and two million at a time by bulldozing the millinery and Saks Fifth Avenue and the dressmaker until one's cheeks burned with a silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Hans Gruber counted it in his head. <laughs> 640 million red hats, and the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the dead Takagi shabby little couch and howl. So Hans did it, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and bullets, with sniffles predominating. Had he shot Takagi too soon? That Holly woman, maybe shooting her would make him feel better. She probably hated hats. Hans finished his cry and attended to his cheeks with a Kleenex. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and he had to get 60 million, 40, 640 million hats out of the vault. He had been planning this heist for months, but 640 million hats didn't go far. Expenses had been greater than he calculated. Only 640 million red hats as a present for John McClain. His John. Many a happy hour Hans had spent planning something nice. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit worthy of the honor of being owned by John. But would John have him? They were on opposite sides of the law. But did that really matter when it came to love and hats? <laughs> Suddenly, Hans rolled from the window and stood before the glass. His eyes were shining brilliantly, but his face had lost its color within 20 seconds. Rapidly, he flipped through his mental Rolodex and assessed what he had of true value. An idea began to grow. <laughs> now, there were two possessions of Hans Gruber and John McLean in which they both took a mighty pride. One was John's repertoire of sarcastic and foul-mouthed comments that had been handed down from his father and grandfather. The other was Hans's ability as an evil mastermind and terrorist. Had Napoleon lived in the flat across the plaza or been on Facebook, Hans would have posted his cunning plans there just to depreciate the little corporal's tactical gifts. <laughs> Had J. Edgar Hoover been the janitor, with all his secret files piled up in the basement, John would have winked and said, Now I have a machine gun, ho, 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 <laughs> as he passed, just to see Hoover pluck at the brazier hidden beneath his shirt from envy. <laughs> Once Hans faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the plush red carpet again, the gift he had thought of was better than 640 million red hats. This was priceless, and he knew John would be happy, wouldn't he? Out went his hand to the telephone, out went his hand to the yellow pages, his fingers stopped at the section that read hospitals. Hans made the call and then gave instructions to his minions. An hour later, a trembling man in surgical scrubs stood before him, held up by Hans's right-hand man, Carl. Will you remove part of my temporal lobe? asked Hans. What? said the surgeon. I will give you 640 million red hats, said Hans. <laughs> and also, I won't kill your family. <laughs> okay, said the surgeon. Oh, and the next few hours tripped by on rosy wings. Hans was under a local anesthetic, literally changing his mind for John as the gunmen watched like wise men under the star of Bethlehem. And then it was done. It surely would be per perfect for John McLean and no one else. There was no other gift like it at any of the stores, even if Hans had turned all of them inside out. It was even worthy of a lovable, smirky asshole. After Hans had shot the surgeon anyway, his intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. He got out some wet wipes and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love. Within a few minutes, Hans's face and head had been cleaned of stray blood spatter, and he looked wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. He looked at his reflection in the mirror carefully and critically. If John doesn't kill me, he said to himself before he takes a second look, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. <laughs> but what could I do? Oh, what could I do with only 640 million red hats that aren't even out of the vault yet? John was never late. Hans's minions had radioed that he was sneaking around in the building in his dear, bloodied, bare feet. Hans sat on the corner of the table near the door. Then he heard John step on the stair, and he turned white for just a moment. He had a habit of saying a silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now he whispered, Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. <laughs> the door opened, and John McLean stepped in. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was barely middle-aged. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without shoes. John stood, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Hans, and there was an expression in them that he could not read, and it terrified Hans. 
It was not anger or surprise or disapproval or horror at any of the sentiments that he had been prepared for. John simply stared at him fixedly with that peculiar expression. He wriggled off the table and went for him. John, darling, he cried, don't look at me that way. I had brain surgery. I had my ruthlessness and genius and villainy removed because I couldn't live, have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. I'm no longer a genius, nor even evil. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. Say Merry Christmas, John, and let's be happy. You don't know what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've had brain surgery to be less evil for me? <laughs> asked John laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet even after the hardest mental labor. I did, said Hans sincerely, with no hint of a sneer. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I mean only better. John looked about the room curiously. You say you're not a terrorist now? You're just a regular guy? He said it with an air almost of idiocy. You need to look for it, said Hans. It'll be evident in every sentence I speak from now on. And no more bombings or hostages. Just fun and knock-knock jokes. It's Christmas Eve. Be good to me, for I did it for you. Maybe the lobes of my brain were numbered, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I kill the rest of the hostages, John? You see what I did there? That was a joke. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Oh, oh God. I am such a wag now. Don't you love me? Out of his trance, John seemed quickly to wake. He unfolded his Hans. For ten seconds, let us regard, with discreet scrutiny, some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight red hats a week or a million, what's the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. John let Hans go and turned away. Only then did he notice that John, too, had a bandage on the back of his head. Don't make any mistake, Hans, he said about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a surgery or a lobotomy that could make me like you any less. <laughs> but if you'll unwrap that bandage on my head, you may see what you had me going. Why well, had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the bandage, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then alas, a quick change to hysterical tears and wails necessitating the immediate deployment of all the comforting powers of John McLean. <laughs> or there, under the bandage, Hans could see that John, too, had had brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do, asked Hans? What did you do for me? I knew I couldn't be a sarcastic asshole or a cop anymore and be with you, so I turned in my badge and I had brain surgery to regulate my smirk and my sense of humor. Just a small lobotomy, a bit of pipping. I did it for you, said John, as he took Hans's still slightly sticky with blood hands. <laughs> Isn't it dandy, John, said Hans. You'll have to look at me a hundred times a day now because I think your IQ may have dropped sharply and you may not know what, who I am. <laughs> John tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Uh, doesn't that hurt, said Hans. Hans, said Sean, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present, and now suppose you put the chops on. Seriously, John, I, I think you might actually have really bad brain damage. <laughs> John McLean took Hans Gruber's hand in his. I love you too. Merry Christmas. Hans Gruber sighed and picked up his automatic. He walked behind the couch and shot John McLean in the head, swiftly and with kindness, for that is the gift of the Magi. yippee ki -yay, motherfucker, Hans whispered. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts and hats to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, though perhaps involving less bloodshed. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish men in a corporate tower who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all the gifts these two were the wisest, O oh, all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest, they are the magi, unless they have been shot in the head. Then, not so much. Thank you.